Standing right here almost 2,000 years ago in 142 AD, I would be the northernmost Roman in the empire. I probably wouldn't even be Roman by birth, but an auxiliary, maybe from what is now modern day Germany or France or even Syria, very far from home. Looking out across this exact ditch at the frontier, Caledonia, home of tribes of Celtic Britons, now cut off from the rest of the island of Britain by a three meter tall turf wall. Not Hadrian's Wall, which is a hundred miles south of here, Antonine's Wall, commissioned by Antoninus Pius, successor of Hadrian. This would be the less permanent, shorter, and nearly unknown barrier that pushed the Roman Empire to its northernmost official border. Roman soldiers marched beyond the wall, but it was here that semi-permanent settlements, structures, battlements, and infrastructure was established. Everything beyond the wall was wild country. In classic Roman-style engineering, a massive ditch was carved clear across the thinnest portion of what is now Scotland, where Edinburgh and Glasgow now sit. Straight lines were a hallmark of Roman construction, their doctrine essentially ignoring the various nuances of nature, like hills and rivers. Years of effort were obviously put in by potentially thousands of soldiers, laborers, slaves, engineers, and logisticians, and it would all be abandoned after only about 20 years of service. Despite the fact that it was called Antonine's Wall, all that remains almost two millennia later is the 40-foot wide ditch. Unlike Hadrian's Wall built of stone, Antonine's Wall was just under 40 miles long, made of turf, and sat atop the southern embankment. Although made of turf and about 10 feet high, the additional 16 feet of ditch provided a formidable approach for anyone intending to attack from the north. This was a Roman barrier. If you intended to penetrate the border of the empire, it would cost you. The ditch and walls weren't the only things that would make someone reconsider potentially rushing south. Portions of the defensive network are still visible here at Rough Castle. Leading uphill to the ditch from the attacker's side would be a patchwork of holes known as Lilia. Three feet deep and covered with loose vegetation, they would conceal sharpened sticks, probably covered in animal manure. So if you managed to survive arrows, lances, the fall into the pit, and the booby trap spikes at the bottom, you would probably have a few painful days of infection ahead of you before your death. Going straight at the wall would be difficult, but the Romans were nice enough to give you this angle to make it easier and also expose your unshielded side completely to the archers. And all of that was the first thing any attacker would encounter in their assault. The rest of the hill would be covered in loose rocks, making it incredibly difficult to climb and gain a foothold. If you managed to skip past the checkerboard of death and the crumbling slope, your next stop was the top of the ditch across from the wall. Built very intentionally to skyline a person's profile, those Romans along the wall now had a perfect vantage point. Even at night, they would be able to see your silhouette. Perfect for a well-trained archer. But you've come too far to give up now, so down you go into the ditch. But of course this isn't your garden variety gully. V-shaped, you would rapidly gain speed in your downhill portion, trying to gain as much momentum as possible to get up the facing slope to the wall. The Romans knew this, of course, and designed it so that at the bottom of the ditch, when you're traveling your fastest, your final step would be into a camouflaged trench, only about a foot wide. Perfect for you to go full speed into, breaking your ankle or leg in the process. And that camouflage would often be bramble and thorn bushes, ancient barbed wire. But maybe you've made it. So there you are in the upslope leading to the wall, looking up at a young man on the high ground with 16 vertical feet of slope and 10 more feet of wall between the two of you. He's got a bow, you've got a sword, maybe, if you haven't lost it during the obstacle course portion of the battle, which hasn't even really begun, honestly. It's not a great place to be. But maybe you should take all those defenses as kind of a backhanded compliment, because why would these world-conquering Romans create such an elaborate defense unless they knew you were a legitimate threat? Maybe that knowledge is enough to make your point that you shouldn't be messed with. Here at Rough Castle are some of the best visual remains of what is left of the Antonine Wall. Archaeologists can determine where the commander lived and where his headquarters was located, where the granary that fed the men was, 
and where their barracks were. Bathhouses for hygiene and relaxation would be here. A great example of a Roman bathhouse is found nearby at Bearsden, just outside Glasgow. It's so well preserved that the sewage system has some, let's say, remains in it. Remains that showed evidence of not just local agriculture, like wheat and barley, but also spices, seeds, and foods from across the entire empire, potentially as far as the Middle East. It is proof of how robust and expansive the logistics system was across the continent, and then out here to an island at the edge of the known world, feeding over 30,000 troops across Britain. These troops would venture as far as 100 miles beyond Antonine's Wall, supported by a fleet of ships along the coast, up the eastern portion of what is now Scotland. They would battle and subjugate the tribes as much as they could, but despite this, beyond Antonine's Wall was then, and would mostly stay, wild, unregulated country, at least by Roman standards. The Caledonians and British tribes had a robust culture, pride, and aggressive warrior spirit, enough to challenge the legions. Roman camps have been uncovered, but no significant fortresses were ever constructed, proving that they weren't able to stay beyond the wall for very long. The wall itself served multiple purposes in its short life. Being at the thinnest portion of the island, it meant the wall could be shorter, with less outposts, and therefore a smaller footprint needed to man and garrison it than Hadrian's wall. This relieves other soldiers for duty elsewhere. Additionally, the natural choke point would funnel any movement by locals and travelers directly through only a few locations. If the wall wasn't only used as a barricade, then the Romans could easily channel anyone trying to go north-south through their gates, like here at Rough Castle. They could meter passage only to those they deemed fitting, and of course, impose attacks if necessary. It also served a role in public relations for Antoninus Pius. Following the successful reign of Hadrian left some big sandals to fill, and having not commanded any legions or participated in any conflict whatsoever really, a quick victory would help his otherwise docile image. So what else to do but reignite the northern campaign and extend the empire just a little bit more? Coins were struck commemorating the achievement. Inscribed stone slabs, now located in a Glasgow museum, show reliefs of the achievements of the men who conquered these lowlands and built and defended the wall. But after retaking the hundred or so miles north of Hadrian's Wall and establishing his own, Antoninus's reign would come to be known as one of the most peaceful during Rome's height, the Gilded Age of the Empire, courtesy of the five good emperors, himself and Hadrian among them. Towards the end of Antonine's reign, the soldiers would withdraw from the wall and march back down to Hadrian's Wall for a more permanent defense. It is believed that the cost of conquering the Caledonians was seen as too high a price to pay, and leaving them be the most practical solution. The space between the two walls also yielded little that benefited the empire. More value could be found pursuing lands outside of Britain on the other side of Rome. All that really remains now, 2,000 years later, is a ditch and a bit of a hill. Check out another video here. Thank you for watching. Thanks to my Patreon subscribers for helping me get here. As always, until next time, get lost.